All right. Well, I, I just want to start by saying uh, that I'm, I'm really, really happy and thrilled to be here because Joomla as a community and software and everything transformed how I did business, how I worked on the web, and transformed my career. So I owe a lot to this community, a lot. And I'm very, very grateful. Um, I was working with Mambo, Mambo, I was never really sure how to pronounce it. Um, when things forked off and Joomla started, and I started with Joomla right at that point. Um, admittedly, over the last few years, I haven't worked with Joomla as much, though partly to do with some of the projects I've been on and companies I've been working with. But I, my heart belongs to Joomla, that's how I kind of put it. So I'm very grateful to be here. Today, though, I'm not going to talk about Joomla. Um, no, actually, I will talk about it a little bit, but really this is more about uh, process, process for the Americans that are in the room. Um, see, I can make that joke because you're not all Americans in the room, so this is great. No, but it's true, it's process. Look how it's spelled. Um, <laughs> but this is specific to a responsive process. So how many of you have worked with uh, responsive web design? And you don't have to be experts, I just mean you kind of know what it is and you've done some work with it. Is there anyone in the room that when I say responsive web design, you're, you're not really sure what I'm talking about? Please be honest. Someone up here is threatening to beat you up, so <laughs> don't come to the front. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go, but essentially a responsive site responds to any situation. So I'm not going to talk about mobile versus desktop. I don't actually believe in that. I believe that there's like a small screen, you know, and that there's different capabilities on devices, right? Um, defining something that is mobile, I don't know. I take this computer with me everywhere I go. It is just as mobile as my phone is, too. And I have multiple devices, so uh, yeah, I'm a major nerd, basically. But we're going to talk about uh, four different things throughout this. So it's discovery, design, development, and deployment. And all those things together make for us a responsive process. At least they do at Yellow Pencil. This is the company I work for. This won't be an ad for Yellow Pencil. I just want you to know that you can connect with me there. Um, yellowpencil.com. We're a Canadian company in uh, Vancouver. That's where I live. I love Vancouver. And, but our head office is in a city called Edmonton, Alberta. It's the northernmost uh, major center in Canada. Yeah. Uh-oh. Fight. Um, <laughs> So it, Wayne Gretzky played for us there. When I was a kid growing up in Edmonton, actually. I grew up there and got to watch some of those uh, NHL superstars play there. We've put together a little site that you can go to at any time, and we're going to be doing some significant updates to it over the next couple months to make it a bit more of a resource. It's called responsiveprocess.com. It just lays out essentially what I'm going to talk about today. But another exciting project coming up is this, Responsive Web. Um, we're going to be doing a big open source, well, big. <laughs> we're going to be doing an open source project to say how do, can people share their resources for responsive web design, right? And so I've got uh, quite a few contributors all around the world that are starting to line up to say, I want to be part of this. So if you're interested, just send me a message. Uh, it's steve at hellofisher.com or on Twitter. Actually, we should just get to that. But first, often when I talk at events, I make awkward jokes. Thank you. Um, I, I use zombie videos to illustrate concepts because uh, I'm a bit of a fan that way, so beware. The session is somewhat R-rated. Um, I'm not going to take off my clothes, though. But, but there is one thing. I thought that maybe this session should be a little bit more serious. You know, I thought, like, we should take these things seriously. So there's one thing that I want you to get out of this. Yeah, it'll be business as usual. Um, I am Hello Fisher across everything that I can be, except on Skype, I'm Hello Steve Fisher. Um, but if you're looking for me on Twitter, that's the best place to find me. If you want to interact with me after the session, maybe even during, I might check it, you don't know. Um, but I, I believe that what I do saves the world one web project at a time. I'm a user experience, uh, well, right now my title is Director of User Experience. But I'm a user experience designer. I believe that what I do is somewhat altruistic. Not somewhat, actually, I believe that it should be and is. And so I like to think that I'm making the web a better place. Quick intro to me, though. This is my wife and daughter. This is where my heart really does belong. This is right after we moved to Vancouver. This is where I live and work. This is the city of Vancouver. I work kind of over on the far side before the water hits again. 
Um, these are the pictures that people sold me on. I've been to Whistler, I've been snowboarding and skiing there. You know, it's beautiful for snowboarding, great for hiking in the summer. You know, the summer I was there looking for my house, these are some Instagram photos I took of the area. This is right by my office. And then I moved there. <laughs> yeah, okay. Turns out it rains a little bit. But I love it there. You know, it is one of these amazing places that it's almost like I live in Disneyland. It's so magical to me. Every morning I get up. Uh, my wife and daughter and I cycle everywhere. This is how I go camping. This was my winter commuter. I've since changed over to something a little bit more like this. Made it as hipster as I could. Um, but I cycle everywhere. My staff thinks I'm crazy because I keep taking pictures while I'm cycling. <laughs> Still have the phone. Haven't dropped it yet. But no, the gray doesn't get me down. I love it there because it's one of the only places in Canada in the winter where I can have this. You know, like uh, this is one of the beaches I go to in the summer. I, I actually think this is hilarious. You know, but I'm like, this is Canada? What do you mean? This is right near our house. My daughter and I out on Father's Day. Lots of great beer, great coffee, insane amount of birds by my house. Um, great music. And it was the first place I did Movember. So I don't always look like a 70s porn star. Um, <laughs> But I, my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer this year. And so I'm raising funds for uh, men's health through Movember. So if you're interested, you can just look up Hello Fisher on there. Thanks. I also created a site to help you get to know, uh, well, solve all your problems. You can go there now or later. It doesn't matter to me, but it's haveaproblem.com. So now you know. Let's get back to it. Okay. The web is not fixed width. It never was. It was never meant to be. Okay? We made it that because we didn't understand our medium. And that's fine. This is what happens when a new medium comes about and we struggle with it. We attach rules that we've taken from other um, disciplines, you know, whether that be print design, signage, uh, industrial design. Actually, the web is a lot more like industrial design when you think about it. But here's an illustration my friend Michael Mesker did. And it tells a little bit of the story of responsive. Right, a little bit of it. And that we have this one issue of what we might call laptop widescreen here, and then we've got um, a small screen. So we've got a mid-sized screen and a small screen. Um, and they're showing different pieces of the content. And we've made assumptions that those on desktops or laptops or whatever they happen to be, the slightly larger screens, um, are wanting to see and able to see more of the content. And we should dumb down the content so we can't see the whole foot and ankle and shin on the phone. But the truth is, people want the same things on their small screen devices. In fact, 86% of the uh, mobile usage in the United States is in the home, while they're sitting on their chair, the sofa, whatever. And if you're like me, you're too lazy to get up and go over to your desktop computer or open it up, or maybe it's at work. 22% of adult users in the United States use only their mobile device. Oh, I said mobile, damn it. Uh, their phones to access the web. So to think that it's not important and that it can be ignored still is foolish, right? This year coming up, 2013, is the year expected to switch over. Um, oh, I just got a message from my mom. Um, yeah. Hi, mom. Um, but, okay. Oh, um, 2013, the mobile web is suspected to take over, predicted to take over for the desktop web as the you know, majority shareholder of who's accessing the internet with what types of devices. You know, so it's no longer, you know, what should we do about these small screens? It's what, what can we do now, right? So let's, let's think about it this way. This is what we talk about as Yale Pencil. Small screen, low bandwidth first. Now, you've probably heard, oh, it's content first, it's mobile first, it's small screen first. It can't be all these things, but this is a starting point for us. We see the most constraints um, where we're seeing that maybe someone doesn't have as many features, they're on like an edge network or something, they can't get on Wi-Fi, um, but they still need access to the same type of content. They expect congruency across their platforms. So, let's get into it. A responsive process. So there's a few videos here, but there we go. 
your memories back. How come you don't remember? Your memories back. How come you don't remember to light us up? Neuralize myself. Nor to neuralize myself. Nor to keep the information for myself. Ah, wait, wait, man, what you doing? Wait, wait, man, what you doing? Follow me to the drive. Wait, no, I remember that. What you remember that? What you remember is you used to drive that old busted drive. I drive. See, I drive the new hotness. Old and busted. Old and busted. New hotness. New hotness. Busted hotness. So it's easy to think of responsive design as the new hotness, and maybe think of web standards as old and busted, but that's not true. That's not what it is at all. In fact, I think that in a few years we won't even call it responsive web design. We'll have thought of better things, perhaps. It'll just be web design, or maybe we won't even be the web anymore. Who knows, right? But web standards, we've built upon this. We owe a lot to the old busted hotness, so to speak. It's not busted. Um, but let's get into this. Let's talk about uh, an initial stage. Now, I'm laying this out in kind of a waterfall fashion. That's not really how it happens all the time. Pieces of it do, pieces of it don't. You know, we follow both uh, the PMI's methodology of waterfall and agile, depending on the project, and a bit of mashup of the two. But we'll talk about this in a linear way. So discovery. What is the discovery zombie movie for this? How do we set up the baseline for our projects? Twenty-eight days later, who knew? Hello! 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 Okay, so for time's sake, I'm just going to cut off that a bit. But um, the zombie genre is wonderful. At least that's how I see it, because it tells the same story over and over and over. Every zombie movie or show essentially uses the same format. You know, someone, and it's usually just like this, 28 Days is a good movie to set a baseline for that. There are others like that that are sort of the quintessential zombie movies. But uh, somehow this guy wakes up 28 days later, the whole world seems to be abandoned, there's things blowing around London, the streets are empty. Somehow none of the zombies got to him convenient, but nice for us. Um, and he will encounter zombies a little bit later, um, and won't know what's going on, slowly discover it, meet up with some of the other survivors, and they'll, well, most of them will die, but some of them will survive, right? So 28 days later sets this baseline. This is sort of the kickoff and, and project charter stage, where we're shaking hands, we're getting to know each other, and understand who it is that we're working with. We need to understand the personalities behind these people, and what it is that they want to to accomplish? What is the why behind what they're doing here, the vision? And so, oh, and by the way, at the end of this, I'm going to share out a URL that gives all the resources for this. This presentation is already online on SlideShare, um, so you can just search for it there. I'll tweet out a link. But every resource that I show you here, like this, this is uh, a rough draft of a project charter. Here's all the things, oh, look, there's a Mick client at the bottom. That was a typo. But all the things that we include in a project charter. So there's a, a Google Doc that has a template for this that I'll share out. But we need to understand all of these things. We need to really articulate what is going on in order to move forward. This is the same whether it's a responsive pro project or just a standard project. But one of the things that I think is key is this. This is a project vision template. So we focus on the why and the rest will follow. So we scroll down here, and this is again just a Google Doc we'll share out. We have the project vision statement, and then guiding principles. So these are the type of things, the values that will guide what you do. You know, so one of them could be progressive enhancement, small screen, low bandwidth first. And goals. You know, we set measurable goals. And then we have a process. Oh, I said process. I've been here too long. I've got to get back to Canada. Process for creating this. Um, so again, I've shared all this out, so don't worry about um, writing this down. But 
what happens with these guiding principles in this vision is when we do a presentation of, let's say, a style tile um, or a, a snippet of code that will do a certain type of interaction, and we realize that it breaks away from one of our guiding principles or the vision, we can correct our course you know, without defining specific features or anything like that. But th these are guiding foundational documents. So then we do an analysis of the project. You know, we're looking to see what sort of patterns can come out as we do research around the users. Um, so ideally, this is before you've quoted on the project, but you're getting paid to do this work. So you've quoted on discovery work. Um, I know that might sound like uh, hopeful thinking. I think it's essential thinking to our industry. You know, I think we don't do ourselves any favor when we don't approach it this way. But we discover the users' personalities. This is three generations of Fisher there. So that's my dad, um, one I'm raising money for, and that's my daughter. Um, you know, we get to know them. So you can do personas. This is an overview persona document that is in the resource I'm sharing out. We say, what are the user's personalities like, the goals? And this isn't made up stuff. So we're not looking at this and saying, well, this is what we think they'll be like. No, this is what we found out they are like, these user groups. These audience profiles are accurate. Okay. Content strategy is in the discovery phase. This is where we begin this. And I think it's something that has been glossed over too much within our industry in general. Um, and it's essential. Your website is a black hole without its content. Right? That's what makes the Joomla project both beautiful and so difficult. Because you're designing a system to handle content that you don't know what it will be even. Right? But once we move into a web project, we need to have this. A plan for how you'll create, deliver, maintain, and govern your content. You need to have a plan for your content. That's what content strategy is. There are tools out there, and I'll give you a quick intro here. This is Gather Content. It was mentioned yesterday. Gather Content is Gather new Content is a new way for teams to plan, collaborate, and collaborate on content. It's really easy to get started. It's really easy to get started. First, you set up a project. First, you set up a project. It could be for a new website. It could be for a new website or a redesign. Now you can add some pages now to your project. Some pages to you can project. do this individually. You can do this individually. Or if you already have or site, map, already have site pages map, in, fire the pages in in bulk. Once you've added your pages, once you've added you your managers, managers in the pages, you manage them in the pages interface. To build your pages, to build you your pages, need to switch, you need to switch to the structure tab. This is where you can add content, content elements, such as file attachments, paragraphs, and single lines of text. So this isn't meant it's to be a CMS drop. here. This is meant to help you plan your content. You could use You can change the settings for content elements and add microcopy guidelines. If something is mandatory, just mark it as required. Using guidelines helps your collaborators to deliver the content. But you really need. Having hierarchy in your content using things like page tables, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is essential. Once you've saved structure content, to your pages, you out. can switch to um, the collaborate tab. Their alpha and their now you're ready to start and gathering I'm content. Really impressed with how they developed it. Fill in your head. Okay. So then strategic direction. So we're wrapping up the discovery phase here. But we need to know if we're headed down the right track. We have to understand um, both the creative, technical content and um, business and search type of strategies. So this document will be a project map, essentially, at this point. You know, so we have a well-defined map for our project. We have a schedule, we have the resources, everything. And we use things like this, too. This is just a really simple one that, um, this one is actually a little out of date, as you can see across the bottom. There's tabs for different browsers. This is where we could put in user stories to say, OK, as uh, this role, I want something so that I can benefit. So as a new prospective client, I want to watch videos to see how difficult the exercises are. So this could be for a fitness platform. Right? And we put in all these user stories. We define a priority for them. Some of them may even get eliminated. We say, you know what, this actually isn't important. And later on, we can test on those in the QA phase. But we have a plan for where we're headed. So then there's design. Now, design thinking happens throughout every project at any point. right? It doesn't matter whether you are a developer, a front-end developer, a designer, a content strategist, a business owner. There's creative design thinking that is happening. But let's take a look at a couple zombie movies for the design. I love that you laughed before I played the movie. Thank you for that. It gets better, though.
into Zombie Land. It's like the greatest hits collection of nightmares. We're actually one of the few non-zombies left, left because we always play it safe. Drive safe. Drive safe. Drive safe. Drive safe. Drive safe. We get taken hostage by 12-year-olds. Girls mature way faster, girls mature way faster, than, girls mature way faster than boys. Okay, these days, instead? you have to watch these days, your back. You have to watch Danger your back. may be lurking where you Danger least expect, lurking where you least you expect find it. A relative, you may find a relative, friend, or neighbor, friend coming, after or neighbor coming after one your thing. Brain. Your brain. This Halloween is forecasted, this Halloween to, be is forecasted for to be a high attacks. season for zombie We're gonna attacks. Help you get through We're going to help you get through it. Intact. Brain intact. This. Is zombies this in plain English. is zombies in plain English. The first step is identifying a zombie. Let's take your Uncle Dan. Let's take your Uncle Dan. Here's Dan, Dan as we all know him. Here's Dan as we all guy. know him. A normal now, guy. Let's look at Dan now, as a zombie. let's look at Dan as a Notice zombie. The unnatural mouth Notice position the unnatural mouth eyes. position and dark the eyes. Will be off the shoulders will be off kilter. Arms reaching. Arms grabbing. reaching legs, grabbing. Limpy. Legs. Skin. Limpy. Pale. Skin. Pale. This is a zombie. This is a zombie. Be careful this Halloween. Be careful this Halloween. You may see people that resemble zombies. Zombies Remember, don't eat candy. zombies don't eat only candy. Brains. Only brains. You may also see them dancing, you may with, also Michael see them dancing with Michael These Jackson. Actors. These are zombies actors. Zombies don't dance. Zombies don't dance. When you encounter a real zombie, you encounter a real zombie a plan. it's time to have a Here's plan. How to survive Here's how to survive an attack. Your first reaction may be, to, first retreat reaction to, may be to retreat to a home or this business. Is only a short -term this is only a short-term solution because they will never, they will never stop. Ever. Instead, Ever. Consider, heading Instead to a Costco. consider heading to a don't Costco. Plan to wait out an don't plan to wait out an attack rations. without proper rations. Now, keep your cool. Now, remember keep your cool. Zombies may remember that zombies may move quickly in the early stages of don't infection. Underestimate their don't speed. underestimate their speed. Also, consider also, a retreat to high consider altitudes. A retreat to high altitudes. Studies, have shown, studies have shown that zombies react poorly to cold, poorly to cold them weather, them weather causing them to become brittle and slow. Zombies Lastly, can't swim. Zombies can't so swim. Via boat so retreat via boat could help. And remember those rations. And remember those rations. If you're not the retreat, that. Common Craft does amazing work with paper prototypes. So prior to working in responsive design, uh, I was a huge advocate for producing lots and lots of sketches, paper sketches, digital sketches, didn't matter to me where it happened. Um, I love the uh, pencil and paper. Um, so it was convenient that I worked for a company called Yellow Pencil. But uh, after that, you know, and that was probably because the cost of developing higher fidelity or production ready you know, sketches or things like that, uh, prototypes, was huge, right? But how do you actually sketch out in a static environment a responsive site when it could respond to any resolution, any screen size? It's not just the breakpoints where things shift around and the because um, that's that's just the adaptive part to it. It actually responds within there, and so you need to see where will it break. Um, so I still do believe in user experience sketches. This is just what I call them. You know, where like this is a project that I worked on where I really wanted to dig in and sketch things out and start to understand it. And some of the clients I worked with, they love getting these types of things and it allows me to think them out. In fact, I was at a workshop in Amsterdam and they provided me with these resources. It was the coolest thing ever. It was like this like James Bond suitcase thing that I opened up and there was Sharpies and post-it notes inside. Yeah, excellent. Um, you know, and there are things out there like the UX, responsive design UX sketchbook, right? Which is great. I'm going to admit it's still kind of limited. There is a, a PDF that you can download off the resource page that I'll share out too. It allows you to get in there and sketch, right? So the next two, they happen kind of at the same time, but I'm going to talk about page tables first. How many of you use or know what page tables are? This is what I expected. So um, page tables are not this. Um, although our content strategist loves that illustration, so that's what we use on the site. But they are this. This is a really simplified version of it. But we used to set hierarchy of content for sites because they were fixed and where everything would go in the positioning of them. But a great illustration of where this didn't work in responsive design is Starbucks. So they redid their site as responsive, right? And they had this really important call to action that was in their sidebar, right? Sort of the top of a right sidebar. But they hadn't chunked out their content. So there's another concept here of chunking out your content, making it smaller chunks of things that are modular and can be moved around. So it's not like we're just shuffling them around like some sort of magician. Um, but 
what happens within those is we need to have hierarchy, priority set. They didn't do that. So when the site was brought down to a smaller screen, their sidebar was just thrown right to the bottom. And it was quite long. So there was this thing that was at the top of the sidebar that is now below the main content, but at the top of this larger section of the bottom, it was lost entirely because they hadn't set priorities and chunked out their content. So here, what we can do is to say, oh, on this page, you know, the first part's sort of self-explanatory, but we say zone one content. So this zone has priority one on this page. What are the tasks that have to be fulfilled here? What's the message focus, the content description? Then we set zone two, priority two content. So it doesn't mean that they exist on one area of the page, but this is the hierarchy of it. So we establish that, and then as content authors are creating the content for those sites, they actually go in and they enter it in like this. They're not thinking about where it goes on the site. They're thinking about why it goes on the site and the hierarchy of it. They're abstracting content from design at this point. Um, because on a responsive site, it's very hard to tell someone, OK, here are the five possibilities for this. Right? And, and I want you to think through all of those and make sure the image is placed in the exact right spot. No, that's up to me to decide that and for them to have a system, a design system to work through. So page tables, they help us with this. We have all this data, but really we're just trying to tell stories. You know, stories are data with a soul. Content strategy, probably the most important part of the project. Interaction design. So I'm kind of making up names here. Um, but, and I apologize to designers that hate it when interaction and visual are separated. It's just an easy way for, for me to talk about this. But when we were redoing our site, and I'm going to apologize for the Drupal reference on this. We dropped it. but. Um, we wanted to wireframe things out and follow our own process. So we did it in the browser, and which is where we do all of our wireframes, at least now. So we could take a look and say, huh, okay, does this work? We have annotations. We say, oh, the slogan, this is what should be there. What does it use? Some of the requirements around it. You can go to this. It still exists at responsiveprocess.com slash yp2012 slash wireframes. Again, the slides are online, so you don't have to write that down. But we can see then how it's going to work in general on different types of screens? What if it was on a portrait view on a tablet? You know, what if we were going to look at it on a phone? How does this work? Is it still producing the right type of messaging? Right? Are the interactions good? Things like this, we dropped. Like, oh, I don't want that to happen. We'll make our users dizzy. But we couldn't really know how it would respond from sketches. So this is how we wireframe. This is using foundation. There's lots of options, as you know, as a community. There is Bootstrap um, from Twitter, which is excellent. Um, there's also Foundation 3 at this point. I love this, that they can say that they are the most advanced, responsive front-end framework in the world. I don't know if that's true, but at least they've got badass icons. Um, you know, but Foundation 3 and uh, Bootstrap are great resources. Lots of them out there. There's no problem in developing your own for your own projects. Um, you know, I know that Bootstrap is sort of a, a thing that's happening with Joomla, though. Am I correct on that? OK, good. Visual design. So in a responsive project, how do you continue to stay out of the device? You can't start to design for a 960 grid. I think that is a wrong approach. But I did it for years, or things like that, where I'm saying, oh, this is the basic screen resolution I'm working from. If anything, it will just keep getting bigger over time. You know, 2007 happens, and boom, we have devices that change that tra trajectory entirely. So I spend a lot of time designing, or I heard someone else talk about it. This is an old version of my own site. Um, deciding in the browser. But there's lots of tools to help us do this. So we, we do have these wireframes that give us some of the interaction patterns. But a friend of mine, Samantha Warren, coined this term. Lots of people are already doing this, but this is a good way to describe it, called style tiles. Anyone use style tiles or know about it? Awesome. This is like a super helpful presentation then. You sounded surprised. OK. Um, <laughs> but style tiles allow us to establish a design direction. So they're somewhere between what we would traditionally consider a mood board, which is a bit looser, and then a design comp, which is a bit too involved and too tight. These give possible colors, possible patterns, um, heading, typography, background things. This is Samantha's, so I, should, I want to credit her to the, these. These are on the site. Here's the second style tile to help a client decide a design direction. Here's a third one. Right? So what happens here is they can say, this fits our brand guidelines. This fits how we want to be represented online in a quick, iterative way without going into a UI for a particular device. 
So we have a blog article um, on Yellow Pencil that talks a bit about this and how we use it and gives away our template for style tiles. It's sort of the Goldilocks just right thing. We're the green bowl in the middle. But then there's style guides where we're defining these decisions. I'm going to be honest, like I do get into Photoshop at some point and say, hmm, I need to create these elements. Oh, I want to have this static comp for this one screen um, to help me think it through. But even better are things like an interface harmony canvas where all the elements can fall in there. This could be done in Photoshop, Illustrator. If you want to do an InDesign, that's fine. The browser, even better. You know, where we see all the elements, design elements of a site, and see, do they have harmony across them? Do they fit together? Someone then can come in, like a, a developer, and take these things and start to apply them, too, if they need to. OK, the one you've been waiting for. The development phase. Of course, like I said, this is overlapping throughout. Um, we are talking back and forth. It can't just be a handoff, because that would be probably a failed project. It's very difficult, because we need to have someone consulting on us about the limitations of a system early on, just as much as they will need a designer to explain some of the design decisions later on. The development zombie movie, though, just came out. Technology. Technology is changing our world. Is changing my, our name world. Is my name is John. My name is John. And this is my world. Making what was once my impossible. Name Anna. My name is and Anna. This is and this world. is my world. My name possible. is Yumiko. My name is Yumiko. And this is my world. And this is my world. With technology advancing so rapidly today. My name is Stan. And this is my world. Imagine what our world will look like. Basically, I'm saying developers are badass. Um, so, um, although if you've ever been involved in a development project, which I'm sure most of you have, you know that it can sometimes feel like it's heading towards the apocalypse um, because of it's been ill-defined early on in the discovery phase, and you're left to solve these problems. Hopefully, that hasn't happened. Now, this is something that I'm going to share that uh, we do on a lot of projects that I don't actually think is necessary with Joomla. So that's kind of a beautiful thing about Joomla. But you, maybe you do do this. I'd be interested to talk about that afterwards. But an HTML build where we actually take um, it outside of the content management system itself and do a basic, so not of the whole site, just with some of the main screens, HTML, CSS, JavaScript build. Now, really, this has happened early on in the design phase where the designers <laughs> I believe you can't be a web designer if you don't understand code. It doesn't mean you have to be the best coder. But at Yellow Pencil, you can't work for us as a designer if you can't code, right? So all our designers do the HTML builds for these sites because we're designing in the browser. How can we do responsive design if we can't do a certain level of code, right? Um, so we're looking for patterns and creating them here. Really, this is a useless slide. I just love the picture. Um, but then there's this. Okay, so. With Joomla, and this was a big shift for me. I work with a lot of proprietary <coughs> Microsoft systems um, right now. Um, hugely expensive, incredibly complex, so sometimes it gets applied to the CMS. But it blew my mind that we had to do the HTML build before uh, or on these projects, and we couldn't just start in with a template or um, some sort of starter kit that way. But in the CMS build, you could have this. Oh, hang on. Yeah, that's better. Ah, <laughs> sorry. It was, uh, it was supposed to happen a lot quicker. <laughs> but you know, you go in and it's so, well, I look at it as easy to configure and start to get going with uh, a Joomla site. In fact, I think that's why it has such great adoption rates. Um, you know, in that, that when I started using it, it kind of made sense to me. Right? And I was able to discover things on my own. And then once I got involved in the community, it got even better for me. But the truth is, as you build out your site, no system is perfect. You're probably keenly aware of that as you work on things. And so it's important to help work with the system and leverage the capabilities of it and improve it for the future, you know, to think future-friendly with that. 
This used to be browser testing. Now it's just testing. I'll call it device testing. This picture was simpler a few years ago. You can see my bias here, but um, uh, and that's more recent. But really, like working with Internet Explorer 6, that's like a piece of cake now. When I look at it, I go, this, I wish that was all we had to do. Because we start to think about this now, where um, like I have about 15 different devices of my own, right? And as a company, we have lots because I do a lot of testing. So I know what it's like to use Android and iOS and Blackberry, um, PC, Apple, it doesn't matter. But you know, we could be using different browsers on different devices. In fact, let's think about Android alone. So let's just take a quick look at Wikipedia here, and this is from a little while ago. We'll go down to smartphones, we'll see, okay. So we've got four columns, the name, the release date, Android version, and the display resolution. So we see that the display resolution and the uh, Android version are different for almost every device. No huge surprise there. But let's keep going. So we're in HTC here, some Droid, um, Google Nexus One. I've got the Google Nexus here from Samsung. Uh, so here's LG, Motorola. Keep going. If you're looking at the scroll bar on the side, you realize the problem now. So we'll keep going. Samsung, this is the device, one of the devices I use regularly when I travel. I can take a glass of water because there's a lot to go here. Um, okay, so tablets. We're now in tablets. I know it's going pretty quickly, but e-readers, netbooks, a smartwatch, other devices. We're getting to interesting categories. Future. So future tablets, Android smartphones, rumored tablets. And again, this is a little old. Other future devices. My favorite category. Okay, this is, you know, what do we do? You know, we're looking at scenarios like this where we have testing suites of devices. And the truth is, you can't really test unless you have the device. You know, you can, but it's not quite as accurate. So there are some resources out there, some that are easier to access. This is by no means a perfect resource or an ad for it. But I think it's interesting. Edge Inspect is a new, product for, is a new product for web designers and developers who are working on mobile web projects. It greatly improves, it greatly workflow, improves efficiency workflow efficiency by enabling synchronous browsing and remote inspection across devices. Now, I have Edge now, Inspect, have running, Edge on Inspect running on my desktop and on all these different, and on all these different devices, both iOS and both Android. IOS and, and they're Android. all on the same, network, on as well. the same what network as well. What I can do is I can just navigate to any website and it will sync across all of these devices. Devices, including the iPhone. Now I can quickly see. Now I can quickly see that there happens to be an issue uh, with, this uh, with this mobile experience. As I scroll down, as you, can I scroll see down you can see that that image is on the left, left as well as the text. And I want the text, and to, want be the text the right to be actually on the right hand well, side. Well, I can remotely inspect this mobile, this device. mobile in fact, device. In fact, just by selecting it, right, by here selecting it right here in the Chrome extension. Remote inspection. Remote inspection. Here you can see the code. Here you can see the it's code. Getting the code for that it's getting the code for that device. I can figure out, can maybe, figure out CSS maybe the CSS that's causing, CSS the, problem. That's causing the problem. Change what I need. Change what I need and to. You see it's and you can see it's synced automatically back synced device, back to the device. And you can see that it takes, you care, of that that it takes care of that issue. Now another great feature. Now another great feature of Edge Inspect is the feature. But Edge Inspect uh, doesn't work across all devices, and it's relatively inexpensive. It used to be free, and it used to be called Shadow. Adobe. Um, it's actually not, it, it's not an unreasonable cost at all. But it only works, I believe, on iOS and Android. So that leaves out quite a few devices at this point. It, it does take care of the majority share. But the thing is, we don't know what future devices that we'll be testing on, or what devices people will actually be accessing it on. You know, so it's important to look at the scope of your project and to say, in that early project charter, this is where we see the majority of users, these are the ones that we will test for and focus on, right? And to move forward with that. Odds are, if you've done it right, your responsive site will work on most devices. If it is built from a small screen, low bandwidth first approach with progressive enhancements, so making it more capable for more capable devices, um, it should just work, right? At least it should work. Oh, there's a hand. That's a TV in the San Francisco airport. I liked it because it was yellow. Um, it's, again, not a useful slide. Um, but I didn't want to distract you, uh, but apparently I have. Um, but this is the point. Okay, this is actually a good point in that uh, I, how many of you have used technology that you used to use a long time ago, like, like even 10 years ago, 
and you go to use it and you think, oh, I can't now, this is more complicated somehow, I can't remember how this works. Um, a progressive enhancement approach allows you to you know, be not only future friendly, but also a little bit more backwards compatible. Again, you need to support where your budget can. I don't want to make it like a perfect pretty picture, it's not like that. So there's deployment, content migration, oh my goodness, this is the most exciting part. No, but it's so important. We have to take these pieces of content and get it across to the new platform, new site. Sometimes you can automate that, but odds are you need to clean it up. There's lots of manual time. Uh, we have a project coming up where there's going to be six people working for three months full time to do the content migration. Fairly expensive, right? But again, the content is the most important piece within this. And so this is for a government site, and they have certain requirements around that. But it's important to, to do this and think it through, whether you are doing it, or the client is doing it, or a contractor, someone else. Um, it needs to be done before the site can go live. Once that content is really in there and the, and the platform is ready, you do user acceptance testing. So let's think about the zombie movie. We know what we are shooting for. Please pay attention. This message is for your own safety. A state of emergency has been declared. Should you find your safety, should you find your safety compromised? It is vital that you do not panic. Oh, for God's sake! Oh, he's got an arm Trying to avoid detection. Two seconds. Use weapons to defend yourself. No, no, that's the second up I ever bought. Mmm, purple rain. No, sorry, sorry. Definitely not. Oh, that's nice strange. Sorry. And remember, the attackers can be stopped by removing the head or destroying the brain. Right. Oh. No, that's rubbish. There's zombies out there. Don't say that. No. It's ridiculous. Exactly like 28 Days. They're both zombie movies, but this is what happens when you do your user acceptance testing. It's like someone is moving into a new apartment or flat or their, their new house. You don't know where the dishes are going to go necessarily. You're trying to figure all that out, and you have to have those moments. Wouldn't it be great if you could you know, trial a house or an apartment before you move in? Um, but this is an opportunity for a client to accept what is there and for us to, to adjust when needed. Because it doesn't always go perfectly, or ever. Documentation and training. We need to document the patterns, how we actually, how content authors go through, what is the governance of this. We can use um, some of our QA scripts now that are fed off of our user stories to say, okay, on this document, this person reviewed this, did it pass? Can they actually accomplish this user story? And then there's the launch plan and release. Because this thing, you know, we have to decide, well, it's probably been decided, but where is it being hosted? What level of support? Uh, who will know about this? And what's your marketing plan around this? This digital thing has to exist in the real world somehow. But we often think of this as the end of a web project. We're wrong. It's the beginning. There's the start of the operational plan. Um, I did a contract, or just like a one-week thing with Booking.com. How many of you are familiar with Booking.com? It's a really, really popular worldwide travel site that most people in North America know nothing about, even though it's bigger than Expedia. Um, they have had their site operational for 10 years, right? And they continue to tweak it. It is really amazing their process behind it and their, the data that they have. But when that site launched, that was just the beginning of its life. That was, sure, a party, but this is where we have an opportunity to support, whether that's through SLA, so service level agreements, um, you know, or just this ongoing relationship, but the client, the owner of the site, this is where they start to live with it, right? And we'll be with it for quite a while. Now, I recognize that I'm kind of at time right now. I can stop. Um, I have an additional section to this if you want me to keep going, but I need some guidance on that. It's, it'll mean pushing things back 15 minutes. 10, 15 minutes. Okay, okay. And I think this is the most important part, so thank you. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, there's, a, there's one more zombie reference, but uh, we forget about this. So this is what that vision document was about. 
But there's a thing called the Golden Circle that Simon Sinek has talked about. In 2009, he did a TED Talk where he talks about these three different concentric circles, the what, how, and why. How many of you are familiar with Simon Sinek and the Golden Circle? Yeah. Worth looking into after this. He says everything is driven by the inner core, the why. But we often look at things this way, the what. Anybody here can tell me what they do. What do you do? Oh, Kyle, of course. I knew I recognized you. You do what I do, so you told me. Um, what is it that you do? Web technologist. Okay, people can answer this question. 100% of people know what, right? They may not know, uh, oh, there's no point in seeing this. This is just my site. You can go to it, but I know what I do. My wife is a blogger, right? And she knows what other bloggers do. Uh, these are in the wrong order. We'll skip them. But less of us know the how, okay? So we've got this outer circle of the what. We can all define the what. Then there's the how. The how is a little fuzzier. Like if I asked you, like, how are you a web technologist? It's a little harder to explain. You can kind of get there. It's harder for me to explain how I do the things I do. We've probably all been in meetings where someone says, can you do this for me? You say, yeah, I can. And you go home that night and learn it. Um, <laughs> you know, how we do things, we do some of that. We do it through using Bootstrap, through using Foundation, things like this, different tools, um, techniques. But the why, oh my gosh, the why is so fuzzy and confusing. So Simon Sinek tells this story, and I'm, I'm probably going to butcher it, but where you think of two different computer companies, one that's selling maybe a standard uh, sort of more generic PC, so I won't pick on any company here, um, but you know, what, what are you doing? Well, we're building computers you know, with all these different components so that people can you know, use them, we want to sell them. Right? How are you doing that? Well, we've got these parts sourced from these different manufacturers, and we have this warehouse or this uh, manufacturing place where we put them together, uh, and we sell them at big box stores, you know, at Best Buy or whatever, anything like that. Um, why? Well, we want to make money, you know, and we, we want our, our clients, our customers, to be able to use these. Simon Sinek talks about Apple. So whether you like Apple, agree with them or not, doesn't matter. Just think about this as an illustration. They started off by saying we want to change the world. We want to think different. Are they still doing that? I don't know. But, um, you know, and then they move to the how. How are you going to do that? Well, we're going to develop this type of experience, this hardware um, that, yeah, maybe it'll cost more, but, you know, we are going to single source thing. We're going to bring it in the control. We know what the future will be. We'll help make the future. Um, and then why? Why? Or what? What is this thing, these products that we have? You know, I am not an Apple fanboy by any means. I use the products because it fits really well. But think about the two stories. So you go to one computer company and you're thinking the why behind it is they want to make money, which is reasonable. That is a business requirement, right? Stay alive. I'm nothing wrong with that. But if you go to the, another company and they're saying, well, we want to change the world, you can be a part of that. It's very different. It's intrinsically motivated. They started with the why and focused on it for years. I think we need to see things differently when we look at our projects. Okay, so how many of you have ever watched or know about The Walking Dead? Uh-oh, not a lot. It's a zombie uh, show on television, so here's a, an alternate intro to it. This show does that intro where we see the what very clearly. There's a zombie apocalypse. People are surrounded. They're in trouble. But the how, you know, is sort of the storyline. But the why is why the zombie genre is becoming so popular and has been. Is it's not about zombies. It's about the human story. It's about this human connection, human survival. What is our human response to the apocalypse? That's what zombie movies are about. Well, most. Um, 
So when we look at the web and we start to think about devices and browsers and all that, well, guess what? That is not the web. We are not a bunch of cogs in this. We are people connecting with people. That is what every one of your projects is about at some level. There's another TED Talk um, where the woman talks about how people interact. And when we forget that technology is here to connect us, when we forget that the web is people connecting to people, whether that's one person to another or communities, we are broken, we're fragmented. And I think the why behind the web, all that we're doing, is meant to bring people together. It's meant to heal us in some way, even though we look at it in fear a lot of times. There was a, a thing on the news recently where parents were afraid of social networks and what that was going to do to their kids. And I get that. I'm a parent. Um, but really what we should be trying to do is to make us all wholehearted, to connect it, to think when we do our research, how can this human connect to this human? That's one of the things I like about responsive design and working at Yellow Pencil. You know, we make the web work for everyone. Now, we don't build the whole web, that's obvious. But this is one of our why statements. We are here so the web can be accessible to people. Responsive design is a one method of making it more accessible. Right? Within that, of course, is the code we're producing and how screen readers can use it and all of that. Uh, okay, excellent. No, you know what? It's so important. Um, I have a lot of friends who are disabled users, and they are so frustrated with a lot of the web. And they're used to it. So, uh, but on my own site, when I was starting to think about it and say, oh, I want people to connect with me, to be able to book me for events or just chat, whatever, I realized that I needed a wise statement behind what I was doing, too. But and this is what happens. A lot of my projects, we think about that technology shapes us. Well, guess what? We shape technology. That's what the Joomla community is. That's a definite why behind that, to say we don't let it just push us around. We are the creators of it. My wife's blog, truthfully.ca, she is a broken individual. And she's OK with me sharing this. I'm not like breaking trust with her. And she just came out of a pretty intense counseling program. And she blogs. And she is, like, if you, if you go to the site and read it, you will see just how incredibly honest and out there she is. Um, and as we looked at the why behind when I was helping her build her site, we realized that people just want to be understood. And that was her why statement as it drove the project. AlbertaCanada.com is an immigration site for, it was one of our first larger responsive sites. Well, large-ish, um, about six, 7,000 pages, depending on how you look at it, and in documents. But they were so focused on getting people to immigrate and how they could access this data. It was all about their government rules and the data, you know, and the different users within this, they forgot this, and this started to transform the project. Usernames are people, right? It's not just data. So when you're looking at a responsive project or any project, focus on the why. Focus on well-structured content and then interactions that matter. I think that's the essence of it. We're looking at good content. Um, I won't dwell on this one at all, but there's a concept called COPE, Create Once, Publish Everywhere. NPR talked about it in 2009, and Karen McGrain, a great user experience designer, worked with them on that. So they could create the data in one place, and it could be pushed out to anything. Radio, television, websites, print, you know, the single source. Because we're telling these stories with our data. So the future of the web, what is it? Uh, I always get asked this. Let's take a look at the first website. This is what the web looked like when I started working on it, by the way. Let's see what happens here. This is just a replica of it, so. <gasps> it's responsive! Um, <laughs> the web is not fixed width. But guess what? A responsive process is meant to be a responsible process. Another resource is future-friendly. It, again, it's not going to give you tools, but it's going to tell you how to focus in on the why and not let the how and the what cloud this. Here's the link. <laughs> it's not secret anymore. It's just hellofisher.com slash secret.php. I'll tweet this out. And again, it's online already. But if you ever want to get a hold of me or see where I work, I'm hellofisher at yellowpencil.com. Thank you.